Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We honor you. We glorify your name. We exalt you. You are worthy of praise, Father. Glory to Jesus. Friends, I want to welcome you once again. If you have the opportunity to join me this morning, well, you are welcome to the Porter's Gate online broadcast. My name is Isaiah Phillips Akintola. Wherever you are this morning, may the joy of the Lord continue to be your strength. May God continue to grace you and empower you. May he continue to cause his good face to shine upon you. May he give you rest. If you are able to join me this morning, well, I'm going to continue the teaching we began on why we need to pray. And I promised that I was going to come back and, you know, give us some uh, uh, added knowledge and information because God is upgrading us in this season. And I've done this in a, in a kind of a format of, you know, a, um, a PowerPoint. Hopefully that will, you know, help us to have a better and a clearer understanding and um, a, a picture to how God will have us engage the issues of the day. I've, if you've noticed now for the past a week, uh, two now, it's like God has been shifting our hearts towards the place, amen, of prayer again and intercession. What a teaching we had yesterday, all right? If you, if you are, if you didn't have the opportunity, all right, to, you know, to listen or to uh, uh, watch yesterday's uh, teaching, let me just quickly flash it here on, you know, uh, uh, um, the rise of apostolic governmental inter intercession. That is one, you know, teaching you don't want to really miss. You don't want to, you know, uh, um, forget go back to it again and just see what god is saying so this morning i'm going to continue amen on uh, uh, on this subject all right we want to learn some things all right reason for biblical uh, uh, um focus prayer that's what we're looking into uh, you know uh, my people perish for lack of knowledge god is adding knowledge to us knowledge from every dimension from every area all right we can no longer you know, pray with that, you know, uh, um, old belief system. Excuse me, I just need to get something. Amen. All right, so, uh, um, you know, when you look at the prayer of Paul, okay, when you look at the way Paul prayed in the scripture, you will notice that Paul, you know, has great insights into what prayer is, all right, and um, I've been tracking that, I've been looking at that, and I've been trying to understand, all right, you know, how to teach people, in fact, I've been doing that for years now, that has been something God has laid in my heart, all right, to teach people how to pray, because I discovered that we can teach prayer, prayer can be taught, after all, it was the disciples of Jesus, they said, all right, Lord, teach us how to pray, okay, Teach us how to pray as John taught is as just as you know John taught his disciple. All right, and um, so Jesus told them. He said, "He said when you pray, say." So we begin to understand that prayer is beyond just a you know beyond just communication. It's a conversation. So when you pray, so in prayer there are things we need to say. All right, there are things we need to proclaim. We need to declare. All right, and uh, you know I'm sure. By now, you are used to me reading the scripture in Ephesians chapter 3 of, from verse uh, of, you know, 14. I'm going to read that. All right. What am I doing? I'm just trying to, you know, realign your mind, your thoughts, you know, your sense of understanding about spiritual things. Because if we don't have spiritual education, there's no way we can be effective. There's no way we can be relevant. There's no way we can be effectual in the execution, amen, of, you know, of our, of, of our, calling an assignment in life okay you know life is not just about one area some people are very exposed right, in certain dimensions of life some people you know because of the environment the parents you know they they you know they god gave to them we're, we're able to send them to school all right so they are quite exposed you know in terms of what you would define as secular education all right so they are open they, they they learn a lot of things but when it comes to the things of the spirit they really don't know because they were not exposed to those things they were not taught those things so yes while they have this education and you find that in africa somebody you know has gone to school is learned all kinds of things it's got qualification that person is qualified and you look at the person 
there's no success. There's no, you know, there's nothing to show for it. You, you, you hear this person has got, you know, you know, two degrees and the person is like a pauper. The person is here and there, you know. Why? Because there are powers, there are sources, there are all kinds of spirit that are working behind to make sure that even though you're qualified, all right, you know, educationally, you know, but you cannot exercise, you know, authority. You cannot bring forth. You cannot, you know, move up the ladder of life. But you have the qualification. He has a certificate. I've seen that. In fact, one of my uncle was like that. And you just, I mean, it baffles you. How can you have so much? You know, it's like this person is actually a gold mine, but there's nothing to show for it because you were informed, amen, regarding one area of life. But on the other hand, you're as blind as a bat. And it's for this reason you find qualified, educate, you know, edu educated people go to some of these charlatans, go to these churches, go to Abalis, go to Sangomas. Why? Well, because they are spiritually blind. Because the issues of life is beyond just being able to, you know, read and being able to calculate and compute. There are forces, there are realms, there are dimensions that seek to control and influence your life. Amen. That no matter what you do, you don't just get a headway. And that's a reality. That's a fact. Particularly if you live in, a, in an environment like Africa where, you know, certain things have been, you know, done to frustrate, to hinder. You understand? So, uh, and that's the reason why people, people go to church because they want solution. They want solution. They want solution. But they are not ready to allow themselves to be taught, to be built, to be equipped, amen, in a dimension that will actually make them the solution. Give them all-round all, all sight. God wants us to have all-round sight. God doesn't want us to be ignorant in any area of our life. He wants us to be fully informed, informed mentally, amen, emotionally, physically, spiritually, amen, you know, all our psyche, all our dimensions of existence, and by the way, that's that's some of the things that I'm, I've talked about in my in my latest book. You you want to you know get you know get hold of that material when when I release it. I'm telling you, I talked about you know uh, uh, what you was called the soul knowledge. Many people today are living their life, driving their life by their soul by their soul knowledge, and they call it spiritual. And that's why the enemy can sit on their head. And that's why things are not working out for them. Because you, you are working against the principle of God. The Bible says that Eve said this is, a, this is a fruit to eat to make one wise. She wanted to be wise outside amen, of, of the ways, the knowledge of God, the intentions of God, the program of God. You cannot. You would have thought that after they ate you know, the fruit that suddenly... They will begin to dive into dimensions and reality. Well, they became dead, blind, crippled. You understand? So we have to be taught the principles, the ways of God. We, are, we, are, we, we must grow in what is called spiritual education. I know people who are highly intellectual. And when you look at their life, they are very, you know, they, 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 you know, they are very op opinionistic. They will argue, they will tell all kinds of things. But when you look at their life, things are just not changing. And, and that frustration, they carry it out, all right, even to their friends, to their family, to, you know, they, they, are, they are forever angry. Because they're trying to do all kinds of things, but things are just not working out. Well, because the things they ought to know, the things they ought to change, they refuse to change it. The things, amen, that they ought to correct, they refuse to correct those things. And they think that they are more wiser than God. And God says, sorry, things are not going to work out the way you expect them. You have to succumb. You have to bow. That is why we keep saying we need to come to the end of ourselves for certain things. Amen. To begin to align themselves. If you continue to hold on to your own idea, to your own belief, to your own ideology, to your own you know, pattern of thinking... You're just going to continue in that thing. They say, we've toiled all night. We've been toiling. That's a professional fisherman. We've toiled all night. We, 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 we've tried to fish, amen, at the best of time. We've done everything humanly possible, but we've caught nothing. Life is not designed to be an engagement of trial and error. In any field of life, be it in relationship, in marriage, amen, it's not try and error. In your finance, it's not try and error. 
In your academics is not try and error. Why you go to school and you learn, you get all knowledge. You need to also understand the other side that you are spirit, soul, and body. So there are people who have exposure in maybe in their physical life. You see them, amen. They do everything within their physical, psychological life, but their spiritual life is zero. And then they now think, okay, maybe what I need to do, amen, to, to make up for my spirituality is to join the yoga club. <laughs> Or is to join some elite group who talk about enlightenment. So you have all kinds of people today, you know, who are up there, very educated. And because they know that they are not spiritual, so they go join some cult. They join Illuminatis. They join, you know, Freemason. They join, you know, uh, uh, Rosicrucians. They join, you know, there are all kinds of things there. So they protect themselves. They call themselves the light bearers. They lie to themselves. They die at the end of the day. So God is bringing us into a day of light. God is bringing us into a day amen, of knowledge. My people perish, you know, for lack of knowledge. Amen. Where there is no knowledge, that's why for a while I've been on this scripture era, you know, I, 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 there's another scripture I wanted to show you. But it's fine. Let's leave it. Let's leave. It says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. But the one I wanted to show you is the one, amen, that is talking about where there is no vision. Where there's no vision. And I've been telling you that vision is beyond just an idea of what to do. Vision is beyond just something you want to do. Vision is that your eyes of understanding is enlightened. That you know God's intention for your life. God's plan for your life. That is not just about, oh, I need to be able to do something. Vision is not just about an assignment to carry out. It's about, amen, the scale falling of your eyes. That's vision. Vision. But it's not this vision. The eyes of your mind. Let me read the scripture. You know, I love when God begins to speak to us like this. You know, you 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 steer things in, in people, all right? Some people don't like it, all right? But I'm not about you liking it. I want to set people free. I want to set people free. I want people to come into freedom. I'm not about you liking it. You know, whenever truth, amen, you know, I, 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 I gets you angry, it, it means that that area, God wants you to deal with it. It means that's an area. Whenever you hear a truth, may not be from me, from maybe from anybody. Whenever you hear something that is truthful, but it gets you uncomfortable, it gets you angry, it gets you. It's like it's like you want to fight the person. That's a demon. That's a spirit in you, and you need to deal with it. Because truth, we have to love. In fact, that's how truth works. You have to love it. Truth may be painful, but you have to love it. You have to love the truth. That's how God set me free. That is how amen, I'm able to do what I'm doing today. You understand? True, when truth confronted me, I began to realize I've been, I've been, I've been way in the scale. I've been found wanting. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to change. <laughs> I'm supposed to repent. So I became a lover of truth. For those who know me, they will tell you if there's anything that I love the most is the truth because it's the truth that set you free. I've tried all kinds of things. I've been all kinds of places. I've tried to connect with all kinds of people. No, they don't have it. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father, to the things of God, except through me. Let me read the scripture again, and I'm going to go into all right, what I want to share with us. Okay? Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 let's take it from there for this reason I'm just laying a foundation again if you will maybe building a framework to amen these things that I'm introducing to you so you know why you need to pray and I've given eight points then we talked about two or three you know uh, I think a few days ago but I and now I've added the two because the last time I came it was just six that I was showing us but I've added the two it's complete okay and you're gonna see it now but I need to read the scripture I need to read the scripture why do we need scripture because scripture amen is the referral is the reference point that guides amen and define what we define or what we know as spirituality there is no spirituality Amen. Outside of the framework of biblical amen, scripture. So there must be a scripture guiding or else anybody can present anything to you in the name of spirituality. Those who are into the worship of our ancestors, those who are into the worship of God knows what, <clears throat> who are into all, you know, all kinds of things, that, that they are expressing spirituality. You know, 
yeah, that's an illegal spirituality they're expressing because the world itself is designed to be spiritual. You and I are spiritual beings. So everything around us, amen, by design, by extension is spiritual. So if you don't know, amen, what, and of course man fell, meaning that that spirituality was corrupt. And like I always say, there's a spirituality within the soul realm. Don't ever think the soul is just about intellectual knowledge. No, no. There's a, there's a, there's a corrupt spirituality within the soul of man. Ah, Jesus. And if you don't know the difference between amen, the spirituality of the soul and the spirituality of the spirit man that is redeemed of God, ah, the devil has gotten you, I'm telling you. Because the enemy, I mean, you will be in a place and all of the things they'll be doing and they'll be talking about will sound spiritual and you'll be shaking your head. Yes, yes, yes. But there's no concrete foundation that connects that thing to God, that connects that thing to the truth, that connects that thing to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the hallmark of amen, truth and spirituality. You can't separate spirituality from the truth. Neither can you separate the truth from spirituality. You get the point? So, if you don't want to be deceived, you have to have a clear amen, and a precise understanding. God is hammering on something this morning. And I hope somebody is listening. Let me read a scripture that I want to read. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16 says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives, derives their name. There's, there's more to that word name there. Please, when you read scripture like this, don't look it and pass by derives their name. All of our spirituality comes from that order. All of our identity comes from that order, from the heavenly father, whom every family on, on in heaven and on earth derives their name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. This is Paul praying. This is prayer. I'm reading a prayer here. So, so I'm just basically giving you a parameter. I'm laying a foundation. I'm giving you, amen, if you will, a, a sense of direction to how effective prayer, amen, should be Jesus said, When you pray, say, Can you see that Paul is saying something here that his understanding of prayer is connected to God's divine intention for the church of Ephesus? And that prayer is reflecting, amen, a projection, something that they must own, they must come into, they must understand, that they must, you know, realize so that that gives them a sense of, you know, a, a identity in engaging life, in engaging their calling, in fulfilling their mandate. If you don't understand this thing, then how do you run a church? How do you run a family? How do you know? Because prayer speaks into God's eternal prophetic intention. You, you get to understand that you align yourself with that and then you start executing it. That's prayer. But let's go on. I'm still, I'm still, you know, reading. Verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, see that prayer is coming from somewhere. Out of God, God's glorious riches, amen, he may strengthen you. Can you see that? I mean, I can build a whole, I can write a whole book on this. You know, the image strengthen you with power through his spirit, not through another spirit, through his spirit, amen, where in your inner being, all right, so that Christ may dwell in your heart, amen, through faith, amen, I pray that you be rooted and established in love, this is a word you've got to highlight them one by one, all right, being established in love, Verse 18, may have power. Can you see that power comes from the nature of God? It comes from love. That you are established in love. Power does not come because you went to do fasting 20 days, 100 days. All right? And then you go, somebody lay hands on you. God's power comes through his nature. Amen? Which is agape. Hallelujah. I pray that you be rooted, be rooted and established in love so we can be rooted and be established in God's love. May have power together with all the Lord's holy people. So it's not, it's not a, exclusively reserved for certain people. No, for all of God's people. So if you can also enter into that dimension, amen, the Lord, I want to be rooted in your nature. That's why you cannot but to forgive because the enemy has a legal right over your life to stop the things of God if you are walking in hate, if you are walking in unforgiveness. That's why, listen, no matter what you go through, what may happen to you, you've got to learn to forgive. I learned that in a hard way. You have to. God knows today I don't have grudge against anyone. I don't hold anybody. With all, you know, I, I don't owe anybody, amen, anger or hatred. No, I, I can't afford to keep it. I cannot. No, that thing is poison. It's poison. 
The power of God will not work in your life. The things of God will not flow out of your life because you are harboring something that connects to the devil. Can you see? There are things that can prevent you from healing, that can pre pre prevent you, amen, from deliverance, that can prevent you from prospering. Yes. Oh, I love this. You forgive that man of God. You forgive that pastor. You forgive that God knows who. You forgive, amen. That woman, you forgive, amen. You teach your children how to forgive. You forgive that brother, that sister. You forgive, you've got to. God is hammering on something. This when this is not my plan this morning. I want to quickly go into some teaching, but God is speaking to somebody here, and I love it when God does that because God knows the heart of everybody joining us. All right, yes. Today can be your own turn. Tomorrow is somebody else's turn. Tomorrow God can be very angry at somebody and say, "Hey, hey, you need to put your life together." Yes, because this is a prophetic platform. I hope you by now you understand that the way you come here. All right, we speak as the Spirit of the Lord leads us. This is an oracle. This platform, amen, is the expression of the oracle of God. I don't have control, amen. I don't have a say. I move as the spirit of God leads me. I emphasize what God wants me to emphasize. So that somebody connecting, amen, who is believing God, amen, can receive healing, can receive deliverance, can receive breakthrough, amen, can receive insight, can receive, you know, foresight, can receive direction. Yes. That's why. That's the work of a, of, of a minister. You understand? All right. Where do we start? Verse 18. I pray. All right? He said that you may have power together with all God's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is that love of God. Amen? Yes. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. So basically what I'm saying is, this is prayer, all right? All right? So quickly, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. We can do this. Come on, friends. Amen? So can you see I've added, you know, two more points from the sixth uh, that I shared with us the first time. So uh, you must just need to follow, you know, uh, the, the, the numbers, all right? You follow the numbers so you see how it goes, okay? You see number one, we've dealt with prayer as, as, a, as a reconnection. We talked about that. I'm not sure if I have to, if I should go back and start explaining everything again, all right? Now, what am I doing? In case you're just joining me, what joining us, all right? So what am I doing through, amen, this, this teaching? I'm giving you, all right, the framework. In case you don't know how to pray, what to pray. Let's say there's somebody who really don't know how to pray. Well, this should be a good starting point. Maybe you're praying, but you're not seeing, you know, results in your prayer life. Well, this should give you a good... If you take all that I've, you know, I've projected here, all that is before you now, and connect it to Ephesians, all right, you know, 3 from verse, you know, 14, as we've been reading, I'm telling you, your prayer life will change. I'm telling you, I can bet you, something will begin to shift, amen, in your life. Are you getting the point? All right? And, you know, sometimes we pray and after we've shared our, you know, our request that we don't know what to say again, you've uh, 10 minutes and the rest is, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. No, no, you can really have a deep conversation with God in the place of prayer. We, yesterday we saw how, you know, um, Abraham was having conversation with God on behalf of a nation. Wow. Wow, I just love some of the things which I'm going to do part two of hopefully today if I, if I have the time. All right. So are you, are you picking something here? So what I'm doing here is just, I call this, you know, uh, 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 the wheel, the will, the wheel of prayer or prayer wheel. Okay. The tire, you know, the, the, the circle, you know, you know, it's a wheel, right? I call it the wheel of prayer. Okay. So prayer as divine a, 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 a wheel. And I'm going to show you something else that I've done that will help you to at least get a picture of what, you know, I'm, I'm talking about. All right. And, uh, I just thought about it. Maybe somebody might actually need a PDF of this. If you do need a PDF of this uh, um, this format, and what do you want to call it, presentation, just DM me, send me a message, okay? And say, uh, man of God, please, I, I, I like what you, you, you've you been sharing. Can, can, can I have, you know, uh, uh, so I'll just put them in a, in a folder, in a folder and send it to you. Hopefully, it should work, all right? Right, because of it should work. So uh, yeah, I, I just thought about that. Somebody might just say, I, 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 I like that. I want to, you know. In fact, if if I'm the one, right, something like this, I will print it out, even make it 
big, you know, put it somewhere in my room. You understand? So this, imagine by the time you finish all this circle, you would have prayed more than one hour. And I, I'm thinking I'm going to do other things that may just relate to this because God, like I said, God is equipping us. God is training us. Everything about our life, it may a source from our prayer lifestyle, okay? Your, where you are right now is, is determined, is measured by your prayer life. Where you are right now, spiritually, materially, financially, emotionally, relational wise, amen. Yes, your prayer life is the submission of your spirituality. I love that. Oh, wow. You understand this? Your prayer life is what? Is the submission, is the summary of your spirituality. You can't grow beyond your prayer life. Your life, your spiritual life, amen, is measured by your prayer life. If you don't have a prayer life, you don't have a spiritual life. Wow. These are things the Lord is just, you know, these are bombshell. You, 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 you get this? So, we, we dealt with num number one, okay? Number one is, sorry, number one, yes, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on track. Number one is prayer as a point of reconnection. I remember saying that when we have a prayer life, then the idea of uh, uh, an orphan spirit is dealt with. Is dealt with. All right? And an issue of disconnection with God is dealt with. So that's number one. Number two, of course, prayer, amen, speaks into the restoration of our identity. So identity, when you're praying, these are the things you should, you should have, you know, at the forefront of your prayer life. A prayer life is not one that is presenting to God, um, you know, requests, prayer requests. That's not a prayer life. A prayer life, amen, is that you are bringing yourself, amen, to God to grow. Prayer grows you. Prayer develops you. Prayer matures you. You understand? Prayer is like a school. That's why we call this a school. All right? Prayer schools you. All right? In the act of, 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 of the spirit, prayer schools you. We grow spiritually in the place of prayer. You understand? I, like I've shared this several times, a lot of the things that I, I know today, in fact, I would say 90% of the books that I've written, materials that I've written, are born out of the place of prayer. This last one that I just finished, amen, I thought I was done when I reached uh, page 160 something, you know, and I began to pray and God began to open my eyes to another dimension that God wanted me to expand. So I, I went and I started adding some, those things. So the book is now 206 page. All from the place, amen, of prayer. Because prayer is the point and place that we begin to grow. We grow base in prayer. We grow depth in prayer. All right? We grow height in, in prayer. Are you getting it? So, so in the place of prayer, your spiritual identity now begins to manifest. It's like they begin to project your true image. In fact, I can, I can tell you this boldly. You don't know who you are until you start praying. Sailor. <clears throat> you don't really know who you are until you start praying. Because prayer will begin to, it's like, uh, how do I put it now? It's like when you begin to pray, the, 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 the veneer, the, the outer man, the, the false person that you are not, begins to give way. It's like, you know, what, what I'm picking in my, in my spirit is like something on the inside of you start coming out. You know, that something is you. The real you start coming out. And the old man start giving, start giving way. And that's why it's difficult. So you understand why it is difficult for people to pray, to really take time to pray. Because it's warfare. The devil doesn't want you to come to your true identity. He doesn't want you. Alright? So, so prayer as a spiritual awakening. Of course, prayer awakens you. And then that's number three. Then number four, prayer as spiritual development. Prayer as divine education. Prayer as the seed of development. I remember saying this. You know, just chipping this, you know, the last time I said, everything God does in our life begins with a seed. So, that your growing is to be able to identify that, am I in the state of a seed or am I moving towards a harvest? That's important that you know, all right, that where you are right now, is it a seed manifestation or is it an harvest manifestation? And then uh, prayer as experiential knowledge, yes. You begin to know certain things. And then lastly, prayer as divine comprehension. All right? They, they, they all almost sound similar, but they are very different. So, having said that, let's look at uh, number one, which we have dealt with. 
all right we dealt with this prayer is where our orphan spirit amen reconnect back to god so you can see what i've done here is what i've done here is i began to expand on each of those points expand but on a on a summary level so but at least when you say prayer amen reconnects prayer is a point of reconnection then you come to all right this point and then you realize excuse me you come to this point then you realize okay what what do i mean by you know prayer reconnects well basically i'm saying that prayer is a place where we get to know that god is my father god is my father all right you reconnect back to him amen you interact with him you come to that point and place of no knowing and I, I tell you it can be very difficult to know god as a father it can be very difficult it was very difficult for me to know him as my father in fact one of the greatest things that have ever happened to my spiritual life is the fact that i came to know god as my father and that's why you see i'm not afraid to weep to cry i'm not afraid for people to see my tears we say oh no men don't cry i don't have that idea i don't i used to but i never i don't again because i'm before my father so when you're before your father it's a it's a secure environment it's a secure space all right you can cry before him you you can you can express the way you feel you know when i'm before my father i'm not looking who is there who is not there i, I don't bother about you <laughs> I'm not, I'm not concerned about you. I'm focused on him. Looking on to Jesus, my face is on him. My, my intention, my desire, amen, is on him. I'm, 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 I'm lavishing my love on him. There's a kind of a love, a relationship, amen, that you, you cannot, you, you, you can't explain between, you know, a, a, a father and a daughter, or a daughter and a, you know, a, and a father, or a son and a father. There's this, there's this mystical love. You can't explain it. You can't explain it. The idea of how we look at love. And that's why, I mean, let them tell you right now that your son or daughter is going through something and they need a part of your body, you know, to fix that thing. You'll be willingly, you will be willing to give it. They say they need, you know, they, they need, you know, a part of your kidney to, 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 you know, to keep your daughter alive, to keep your, you will be willing to give that kidney. You, you won't even think twice. That is, you see, this love, this is beyond just giving. That's why the, the, the scripture say, if you say you have love and you give, but you, they realize that you don't have love, they say it's still wasted. So we understand that love is beyond just giving. There is a, there's a mystic reality. There's something mysterious about the love of the love nature of God. And it's from this point that we speak that many of us, particularly if you're a man of God, you're a woman of God, you're listening to me. If you really don't have God's love, what are you doing pastoring? What are you doing leading people? Because at some point you're going to take advantage of the people. Either because you're pressured, either because you're in need. You're going to start saying things. You're going to start doing things, amen, that is outside of, amen, the book, that is outside the parameter you see, it is, it is that same kind of love that you have for your kids, that you should have, amen, for the people of God, for the things of God. And therefore, you don't take advantage of them. It's like you will not take advantage of your children. I mean, the, 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 the most craziest thing I've ever heard of or in South Africa is that the spirit of incest is rife. That, I mean, a father will seek to go, you know, sleep with, you know, his own daughter. I mean, <laughs> It is crazy. I don't know how to explain that. And you find that really that thing is a spirit. You know that that is not natural. It's not natural. How can you begin to look at your daughter and you 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 begin to lust to the point that you want to penetrate your own child? I mean, what kind of a devil gets into your brain? Are, are you are you getting the point that I'm making? I'm making a point, and we see that today. Yes, you know, it's a spirit that people don't really talk about, but it's a spirit that is almost destroying South Africa as a nation, as a society, particularly among the colored people. Let me, let me, let me highlight it among the colored people. And that's why you will look at as if colored people, they don't really have love. It's something you've got to deal with. It's a generational spirit you've got to deal with. You've got to deal with it. I've seen it happen. And that spirit has destroyed a lot of marriages. This is one of the reasons, because you won't hear that in statistics. You, they won't tell you that. It's one of the reasons why, all right, marriages is not working in South Africa. When you truly probe, when you start probing, why is marriage not working? Why is things going on? Uh, when, if you truly, truly start to recognize you, ah, okay, yes. Because those are things that people are not proud of talking about. 
particularly among colored people. Keep colored in particular. You know, we can talk about this because we're supposed to be governmental people. We're raising governmental intercessors. We want to break hold. We want to break the hold of certain spirit. Amen. Listen, you may say, well, we're born again. Learn if you have not addressed certain spirit that is over and that is in control over, over a territory, that spirit may not come directly to you, but that spirit may affect somebody under your influence, under your, your, you know, your domain, in your household. All right? So we have to be very aware. We have to be very awakened. We have to be very alert to this spirit. All right? If you, if you as a man start realizing that, you, you know, you, when you look at your daughter, you're feeling some, ah, go for deliverance. Quick, quick, go for deliverance because the spirit is in the air. I can continue, but that's not my focus today, all right? But I'm just giving you, you know, you know a, a, an instance that, okay, we have to break away. Prayer brings us to the point where that orphan spirit, that reject, you know, we feel rejected. Why do you have an orphan spirit? Basically, the orphan spirit, all right, all right, is a spirit of rejection. And like I said, I mean, you're born in an environment where you don't feel love. Where, okay, you know, the, the relationship was, you know, the relationship was born out of somebody taking advantage. Or, uh, uh, um, you know, the child was born out of wedlock. In fact, if children that are born out of wedlock, which of course is very rife in South Africa, all right, the, there's a tendency, all right, and the tendency is very high that that child grow up to become, to, you know, to feel rejected. And you wouldn't agree with me that many of the kids that we're giving back to in South Africa, all right, we're born out of wedlock. We're born out of, you know, marriage. All right? Two guys come together, boy and a girl come together, you know, they say we love each other and they boom, they, they meet themselves. Here you are, you have a child. No matter how you try to show love to that child, because that child was not born within the circumference of God's de desire and intention, which is called marriage, you understand? Yes, you basically open the life of that child to this spirit called rejection. It's not until you buy all the world. You can buy the best of the gadgets for your kids. You can give them God knows what. You can do all of that. That is not what addresses that spirit. You violated the values and the principles of God. Come on. I said God is up to something this morning. I, I didn't plan for all of this. But God is just helping us. Are you getting something? So it's important that when we go to God as our father and that's the point I'm not saying you're not praying but I'm saying the reason why your prayer will not reach certain point the reason why you don't feel even after praying that yes you've touched God you've touched the heart of God and God has really touched your life is because there is a blockage and maybe God is addressing that blockage in your own life you feel bitter you feel envy envious you feel heavy People finish praying, they still feel heavy. I'm like, how can you feel finish praying and still feel heavy? You still feel empty. No, prayer fills you. you. You get filled in the place of prayer. Pray is a place where you get free, you get delivered. You should finish praying, you feel light. Yes, those are manifestations of the presence of God. But if you finish prayer and you feel like you still have doubt, then you've not touched God. So you might be dealing with him and, you know, an orphan spirit. I, I hate to use that word, but that is just, I mean, a word that most people are used to. They, they recognize that word. But the Bible says, when you, the spirit of truth comes, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, amen. One of the first things the Holy Spirit does in our life is to remove that, amen, orphan spirit. Orphan spirit is not the fact that you don't have a spiritual head covering you. That's a lie. That's a false teaching that people are pro projecting. And let me give you the other side. And I'm not saying that you having people, you know, covering you, you know, a spiritual mentor, a spiritual father, if you, that, if you want to use that word, all right, that, that doesn't mean that is not good. That is good, all right, if they're right, if they have the right heart, all right? Yes, Paul had the right heart, amen? He mentored Timothy, he mentored Titus, he had the right heart. But you see how Paul also released them. These were leaders, these were pastors in their own right, amen? Yes, you know, Titus was sent to Crete, amen, to go put things right, Paul didn't have to go there. You understand? Yes, that is the work of a mentor. A mentor mentors your father. You know, he gives you knowledge, wisdom, builds your, put resources in your life. And when the time comes, even if you don't want to go, he says, now go, it's time for you to go. Like I feel like that, you know, to some people who I'm, who I'm mentoring, he says, it's time for you to go now. It's time, it's time for you to go. Don't create a problem for me. 
You understand? You will start to sense it that it's time for them to re release them. Even if they go and make mistake, let them make mistake, but let them make mistake doing what they need to do. Correct them, but release them. Fatherhood and mentoring is not that they are under your wings, you know, till Jesus come. No, that's not the purpose. Jesus mentored 12 people. Amen. After three and a half years, what did he do? He moved out of the stage. He says, your turn. It's time. It's time for you guys to shine. <laughs> How many times they made mistakes, but he was there for them. All right? We're not talking about mentor. One of these days, we'll, we'll start a mentorship school, which I've been talking about for almost two years. That we need to start a mentorship school in relating to, you know, Zadok Prophetic School. And it, Maybe that's something I need to really work on and just develop, you know, uh, finish my the material. I've already started. There's just too many things in my head. But anyhow, we're dealing with prayer this morning. Are you, are you learning? Are you picking something here? All right? Prayer is where our orphan spirit, amen, is reconnected with our heavenly father. And I say, that is something you don't take for granted. Many of us, for years, we know God. We know God as God. We know him as our provider. We know him as our healer. We know him as our whatever you want to call it. But many, very few people really know God as father. Oh yeah, we can quote the scripture, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. But pause a while and really think about that word, our father. Who is a father? What's the role of a father? There are people who want, you know, who want me to be a father today. I said, I don't want to be a father. I would love to mentor, I would love to. And when you start correcting them, then they start getting angry with you, see, see? The reason why you're getting angry with me is because you were never exposed to what fatherhood means. Fatherhood is not just, you know, patting you at the back and telling you all the nice things and telling you how you can make it and how you can break, break through. No, a father also sees ahead of you. It's, it tries to, you know, prevent you from falling into certain things. And when you fall into certain things, knowingly, he comes there and gives you a hiding because he's been telling you, he's been trying to correct you, he's been trying to warn you, but you are refusing to listen. So if you if you say somebody amen should be a father you should be you know a, 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 you know a watcher over your life then you should be able to let go and allow the person and I know that's a very difficult thing because many who call themselves fathers have taken advantage of people but when you see truth and you see grace in the life of somebody and you say look I need you to help me then you must be able to trust that person enough to to bring clarity and direction into your life. I will never father people or lead people or guide people who every time you speak, then they get angry with you. No, I'll let you go. No matter who you are, whatever you do, I'll let you go. You don't have, because you're going to hinder me from doing what I'm called to do in the life of other people just because you've got, you know, a terrible spirit. That's the truth. Some people, what they want, what they want in you is just a gift. They don't want the wisdom. They don't want the correction. They don't want the discipline. And we know that God is our father. We know that he fathered the nation of Israel. And we saw, amen, how he corrected the nation. Of, he sent them into exile. 70 years they were there. He's still the father. So you've got to understand the dynamics of a father. Because the father wants the best for you. Amen. And he will do whatever he needs to do. To bring you to that point and place. Amen. Of fulfillment all right i think i've said enough about that okay the second one all right what's the second one let's quickly look at it the second one is prayer restore our identity i know we've dealt with all of this but uh i'm just basically going back to it okay prayer is the place where we reconnect our lost identity and begin to understand amen our visionary calling and purpose can you see all of the things that i'm talking about is like it's been summarized in that ephesians 3 from verse 14. prayer amen is the place where we are reconnected all right we, we are our, you know, our, our identity is reconnected. Prayer is a place where we, we, we reconnect, amen, our lost, lost spiritual identity. Adam lost his identity. Eve lost his identity. And when you lose your identity, amen, the devil takes, you know, takes chance. You can be very religious, but you don't know who you are. And because of that false identity you have, that then shape how you pray. That's why when you listen to certain people pray, you can pick fear, you can pick doubt, you can pick almost like begging God. You can pick, amen, you know, this sense of, you don't know who you are, you don't know what you're, you know, why, why would you pray like this? You understand? I, I saw, you know, something that I, I'm not sure if I shared it on my, 
a Facebook timeline of, of, of a man who was at Winner's Chapel, you know, and here is the bishop coming out, and this guy was kneeling down, and this man was pray, he was crying. He just, Papa, please just pray for me. Pray to Papa, just pray for me. And this guy was sobbing. And here's a Papa walking and talking with another lady. You understand? And and turned back and said, Quick, keep quiet, keep quiet. When I looked at that, that tells me that man does not know who he is in the Lord. His whole life is built on the on, on the life of the Papa, on the prayer of the Papa. No, that is not God's intention for us. That, and that is not respect. That is witchcraft. That is witchcraft, amen, in daylight. Daylight is there. You can find it. You can see it. If you think that your destiny, your breakthrough, amen, is in the hand of one Papa, one man of God, one woman of God, one bishop, one apostle, ah, then you are deceived. He says, so are you saying that the prayer of, you know, God's servant does very little in my life? I've never said that. In fact, their prayer can enhance, enhance, amen, your life. But their prayer should not be one, amen, that you look up to, to the point as if, if they don't pray for you, if they don't touch, if they don't lay hands on you. I mean, there were a lot of people, Jesus healed that he never touched. <clears throat> Are you getting it? The thing is, we're, we're trying to break away from this, this witchcraft, amen, practice that have almost made, you know, people who can pray or people who we believe that their ministry, all right, will give us breakthrough, that we've made them almost like a demigod. Where is Christ? Where is Christ in that? Where is Jesus? That you want to speak to a man of God, you have to go on your knees. You're crawling like a child. Here is a man who, who I mean, he's a father. He, I'm sure he, imagine what happens when the child is looking at his father. In the name of desperacy, to me, that, I don't know about you, but that aches my heart. That breaks my heart. Because that is wrong representation of Christ and the anointing. The first thing I want to do, even if that man is doing it, no, 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 I say, get up, get up. Please get up. When, when, when Paul, amen, got to a particular place and they saw the kind of power that Paul and uh, Barnabas were operating, the people, what did they do? They said the gods have come down like in the likeness of men. They wanted to start worshipping them. They said the gods... What did they do? The Bible said, Paul, they tore their clothes. They said, no, abomination. Don't do this. That is the attitude you and I must always have as servants of God. When the people want to start worshiping us because we, they know that we have anointing, they know we have power, they know, we should be able to tell them, please, don't let God kill me. No. The Papa, you know, you know almost like reinforce that spirit. You know, attitude can reinforce a spirit, a negative spirit in our life. Why do I tell people, don't call me, you know, uh, uh, father, I'm not a spiritual father. You think I don't, I don't operate in the work, in the, in the position of a spiritual father. I know what that means. I do the work of a spiritual father, but I don't just want people to label me. That's my spiritual father. No, I don't want that label. Because I know what that label has done to people. You see, there are things we allow in our church, even though they may seem permissible, but that thing is building an image. I'll give you a very good example. If in your church, simple one, if in your church, I'm talking to pastors now, if in your church, you've got the best seat in the front, you've got, you know, pushing chairs, you know, three-seater chair in the front, and every other people sitting at the back, they're sitting on plastic chair. Something is wrong with that order. If your church, as a pastor, as a bishop of a church, your 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 seat is the biggest seat, your wife's seat is the biggest seat. You understand? You know, your elder seat, your elders in the church is the biggest seat, and every other people, all right, can just sit on plastic or whatever kind of chair you have. All right, something is wrong with that model. That model alone, all right, has projected a wrong Iraq spirit. Oh God, I'm in the house. If you allow people to be carrying your Bible to enter the church, just because you are the bishop, you are the papa, you are God knows what, something is wrong with that spirit. <laughs> oh, come on Lord. I know God was up to something this morning I was not prepared for. You see, you, you, you may not see anything 
anything, you know, wrong about that. That's why Isaiah is telling you that it's wrong. Because you are telling, you see, even the way you dress, if you overdress in an environment where people, all right, are, you know, are, are still struggling. If you run a church where, let's say, the average person there collects, you know, uh, uh, 20000 a month, let's just say. And what you're dressing, you're dressing for that day, all right, what's, you know, 30000 that is a wrong spirit. That is a wrong spirit. It's a wrong spirit. You see, there are certain things that we think it's okay, but they are not. They are, the Bible says all things may be lawful, but all things are not permissible. You may look at them and say, these are right things. I'm telling you things that could help people, that could help your church, your ministry, the, the community of prayer. All right? Yes. Because, you see, the church ought to be a family. Ought to be a family. Oh, God. But I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about, I'm addressing prayer. Okay? We're addressing prayer. But I'm telling you how the enemy can sneak in by ignorance. Through wrong projection, how the enemy can sneak in. If you always project, amen, that you know you are invincible as a leader, as a prayer, you know, warrior, you are always invincible. <laughs> you, you are basically exposing yourself to certain spirit that will bring you down. And when you are brought down, the enemy will so shame you, and you'll be so ashamed that you will not be able to reach out to the brethren and say, I need help. Because you've projected yourself as if you're better than them. It's a wrong identity. So we have to develop, amen, a place where we have the right identity. The right identity, amen, is designed when we look at Christ. It's Christ that def defines our identity. And when you start to pray with, you know, with, with the right heart, they start to align your identity. Because you will notice something when you truly pray effectively. You will come out with the spirit of humility. So I wonder what kind of prayer people are praying. Because when you finish praying, what we see is pride, not humility, not submission. We're not seeing the wisdom of God. We're not seeing the love of God. So where did you get a prayer from? Where did I, who, who did you connect to in God? Prayer will always bring you to the point in a way you diminish so that Christ can what? Increase. Prayer is a place where we relocate our lost spiritual identity. When you start to pray, they will start to show you, reveal to you your true image. Maybe the devil, maybe the world system, maybe religion, tradition has given you a false identity. When you start to pray, amen, prayer starts to align your identity. Identity matters to God. What the enemy has always sought for from the beginning was to corrupt the identity of man. was to corrupt the identity of man. And he did that. He said, well, you eat. You eat, eat the fruit. You will be like God. You will know good from evil. It was the greatest lie sold to man. A man bought it. You know your identity. You begin to understand your true visionary calling and purpose for life. You begin to know who you are. Listen to what I'm saying, friend. I'm not talking about knowing what you are called to do. Hello. You start to know who you are. Who you are, amen, yes, is what leads to what you are called to do. Not what you are called to do first. I know that's what we've been teaching, amen, when it comes to vision. It's like we, we project an identity of doing. The identity of doing is very good, but it's not good enough. The identity of our being, of our of our person before God matters and is more important than identity of doing. Because if what you are praying and seeking for is God, I need to do something, show me what to do. You will do something, but you will still not get fulfilled. You will still not feel you're complete. You see, let me tell you this. Your anointing does not complete you. <laughs> The anointing is given for a service. The anointing is given for a, a service. What, what completes you, amen, is your place and position, yes, before the Father. 
is your relationship before the Father. If your idea of ministry, your idea of prayer is about being able to do something, and there's a lot of things we're going to do in this last day, but I'm saying if we project that first, we will miss it. Who are you? Do you know your place? A man had two sons. Luke 15. Both of them don't know who they are. Both of them. Both of them were suffering identity crisis. It's just that, amen. The, the, the issue of one is different from the other. The identity crisis of the young one is different from the identity crisis of the elder one. But both of them had identity crisis. They didn't know who they are before their father. Both of them, all right, felt amen, a sense of entitlement. It's just that their, their expression differs. The, young, the older one too, amen, when the younger one came back after squandering and wasting his father's resources, the older one says, he was angry. He said, but, but how would you allow this to happen? Look at me. I've been working. I've been sweating. I've been, you know, enslaving my life for you all these years. All these years. You never killed a calf for me. But this, this naughty one who squandered everything you had, now he came back and you still gave him this kind of welcome. This, you know, no. Can you see the old one too was suffering an identity issue? The father said, why are you angry? Don't you know? It means that he was suffering ignorance. Don't you know that all this thing that I possess belong to you? Why? You are the firstborn. You are my eldest son. So you see, even as a son in the house, he still did not know who he is. And that's many of our, many of our problems, particularly those of us who are in, in, in you know, in the frontline ministry. We're like that older guy. We don't really know identity. And that's why we want all the jets. We want, you know, you know, a, 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 a house of, you know, seven, you know, you know a, 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 what do you call it now? Seven bedroom apartment. We want things, all right, that we don't need because we want to prove a point that, you know, we're the first, we're, 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 the, we're the firstborn. We, we, we have power. We have authority. All the things we are accumulating to those who have insights are, are a proof that we, we lack identity. We are suffering identity crisis. When you walk into a place and the dressing of a man, amen, is the loudest, making noise, pulling, calling, say, hey, hey, look at me. You know that person is suffering what? Identity crisis. That person is dealing with issues, amen, yes, of acceptance. So that person needs to be loud. So you, you buy that car because you want to make an impression. You bought that wristwatch because you need to make an impression. Not because you need it, amen, for the job you're doing, but because you need to make an impression. I've got to let them know. So when I walk into the church, <laughs> even the worship must stop. <laughs> The worship must stop. Your life is a projection, amen, of the brokenness of your life. But you're hiding it, amen, with another certificate. You're hiding it with the program you're doing. You're hiding it with, you know, the kind of places you go, the kind of people who are your friends. You're, you know those friends, amen, will compromise your faith, will compromise your spirituality, but you need to be among them because of the caliber of people they are. You are not secure in, your, in yourself, in your identity before the Father. You see the point that I'm making? Prayer helps you to define who you are. You say, that is me. I can be on my own as long as I'm with my Father. You know, yesterday, this place I'm living, for the first time I took a walk on the other side. I've, since I've, I'm like, wow, I've never been here before. I'm just walking. You know, I don't bother. What, what am I looking for? As long as I'm before God, as long as I'm before what God will have me do, I am fine. I am so secure. The only time I'm not secure is when I know that I'm not in alignment with my father. I don't care who you are. You can go. I don't bother. I don't worry. Because you know one thing? I know certain things about myself, amen, that I've discovered before my father. It was yesterday I was talking about that. That David, David could fight Goliath. Amen. 
because he knew who he was in God. The reason why David could challenge Goliath is not because David, you know, so much believed in himself. No, because he believed in who he belongs, where he belongs. Many people, many Christians don't really know. Oh, let me know if it starts. Exciting things that are premature to say. You need to wait. Are you getting this? Prayer is the place where we relocate. We relocate it. You've, you've lost it. You relocate it. And that's why the devil fights you, amen, from going into the place of prayer. That's why. You, you will see. You will have time for everything when it's time to pray. No, you don't have time. And if you finally pray, you're just going to give God a list. <laughs> Or you're going to report somebody. Or, you know, you're going to complain. Who told you that all those things define prayer? You see? You see why God is telling us that we need to relocate. And I'm sharing this to help us to know why we need to pray. What defines our prayer life? Look at, look at Paul. He wrote one third of the scripture all born from the place of union of relationship with God because that's what prayer does prayer reunites you to your father he reconnects you you begin to have you know ideas creativity why because you are before the creator of all things. how can you say you you have a prayer life and you you are not creative how oh, it's impossible I always say to people how can you say amen? You, you 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 have a prayer life and you don't know what to do about your business then you are not praying because in the place of prayer you know they would start injecting things they will start putting things they will start aligning you they will start amen bringing you into depths regarding what amen relates to your life Prayer opens your eyes. It opens your spiritual eyes. Paul was praying. He heard a voice. In the place of prayer, they said, he saw a vision. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Paul was praying when he saw Aeneas coming. You tell me prayer does not lead you into the power of, the power of giftings, the prophetic gift? It does. The enemy wants to benchmark your prayer to all these beggarly elements, these earthly material things. And that's why what, what many people, you, you read most books on prayer, it's about what you can get from God. The testimony, I prayed God gave me. No, no, no. I pray God changed me. And these are the ways God changed my life. Because if your life is changed, you become an instrument, an, an agent to change other people's life. So we've read books, we've consumed a lot of books on prayer that is basically just limited to your needs being met. At the end of the day, you look, look, look back 10, 20, 10, 20 years after the, those books were written. Go look at the life of the people who wrote those books. They've compromised everything. You know why? Because they were not changed. They wrote those books out of the testimony of where I pray and God answered my prayer. Excuse me. The prodigal son, the young one, did, did, did his father bless him? Did the father knew that he was going to squander it? Yes. But the father still blessed him. So don't make the fact that God gave you certain things that that is an answered prayer. That, that is just a way of God showing you how foolish you are. <laughs> Not every result of your prayer, a manifested result is in fact an answered prayer. Some is God just trying to prove. We'll see with time. We'll see. I wish people can go back and say, you know, I prayed. God gave me something. And after five years, you know, I messed it up. And I want, I want to write a book so you would not fall into the same mistake that I fell into. I thought I was ready, but I was not. But God answered the prayer because he's God. You think, you think those things that the Father gave, you think it affected amen, the wealth of his kingdom? No. The father didn't even bother to ask when he returned. So what did you do with the money? What did you do with the car? What did you do with the house? What did you do with the... No, no, no. He, no, no. he just said my son was dead. I don't want us to start going back to that scripture because we will start another, <laughs> another seminar. 
My son that was dead has now been found. He was lost. He's been found. That's what the father said. This is my son. He was once dead. He's lost. But he's been found. That is the heart of a father. He's not bothered. So all those things that you've accumulated, so where are they now? <laughs> the Bible says he lived a prodigal life. He wanted, you know, the devil's been whispering to him, there's so much you can get out there. There's so much, there's so much, there's so much. Come on, push yourself out. <laughs> I pray we will truly experience the Father. Because when we do, we will not be seeking for something else. Listen, there's a lot of things we need, and he knows we need them. And when he feels that we are mature enough to have them, after all, the throne belongs to us. But you're still a prince. You're not mature enough. You don't know how to handle people. You don't know how to regulate amen, leadership. You don't know how to administrate. You have not learned how to handle the giftings. You have not grown. You have not matured. You don't know how to handle the sling. You don't know how to handle the sword. But you want to go to war. But you want to prove a point. You want to be out there. They say, no, this is not the time to show yourself. Let's continue to shape and mold you. So you can grow until the day of your speaking forth. We have a sister and she has no breast. Have you read that before in the book of Solomon? Songs of Solomon? We have a sister. What are we going to do in the day, alright? She's, she's to be given to marriage. Those brothers were wise. They said we will begin to prepare our sister. We need to begin to teach her. We need to begin to... We have a sister but she has no breast. That's a scripture. But that's a parable, amen, of an immature church. Years ago, as a pastor, God showed me that scripture. You understand this? And that's why I was saying, was if yesterday or a few days ago that, you know, parents, don't, don't, don't overexpose your kids to certain things they are not ready for. Don't. Because you're going to put pressure. It's the pressure that is causing some of our members to fall into all kinds of sins because, uh, yes, we push them out there. Uh, yeah. Because somebody's got a gift, can sing. That doesn't mean you should give her a microphone. You need to make her sit down first. Teach her the ways of God. Teach her what the spirit of a psalmist means. Your gift is not, is, not, is not just to go out there and start singing because you've got a nice voice. But all we want to see in the church today is just a nice, oh, that sister can sing, wow. But what about our life? What about our spiritual life? What about our development? Amen. What about our sense of maturity? What about our identity? Yes, she's got a gift, but she, she's still struggling with so many things. But all you see is a gift. All you see is a shape. Hey, that brother can pray. But do you really know, amen, what's going on in his life, in his private life? So we overexpose, we expose gift before their time. And the devil, of course, you know, understands that, so he takes advantage. So the brother is praying, the, the sister is singing, but at home, everything is going crazy. She, in fact, she's living in sin. She's collapsing, she's falling. All kinds of things are happening to her. All kinds of things are happening to him. But you don't care. All you want is that he must just come to church looking nice, well-dressed, all right? Take the microphone and sing down like Nightingale. But this is somebody struggling. So, so sometimes, church, we know how to kill, you know, a gift that is still in the making. And to, the, to, you know, to, you know, to make the thing worse, we then begin to push the sister to go and join, you know, uh, church has got talent. <laughs> what do they call them now? I, church idols. And you say, wow, just look at that kids. You expose a child that is still growing. You expose that child to stage that will kill that child. Oh, come on. Is that? You're preaching a sermon here. I'm supposed to just be giving you a PowerPoint. <laughs> Let's go to the third one. Which we actually dealt with. All right, We actually dealt with all of this. But I'm just showing you something. I hope somebody is really getting... Uh, you know, blessed with what we're sharing. So the third one is, let's look at it again. The third one is prayer restore. Oh, no, no. Prayer as a spiritual awakening. All right. 
So that's the third one. I will guess this. Is, yes, you can see. It's a three. Prayer is the place of awakening and the restoration of our spiritual. Have you noticed one thing so far? We have not said anything about prayer relating to request. You know, uh, uh, um, God, I, I need a car. Lord, I need a house. And please, I've not said those things don't matter. Please get me clear. Unless you misquote me. Please do not misquote me. I'm not saying your needs are very important. God doesn't want you to live on the street. All right? When, you know, uh, unbelievers are living in mansion. God wants you to live in a good house. God wants you to have a good car. God wants you to have a good home. Amen. God wants you to have a nice career. After all, those things are for the furtherance, amen, of his glory in your life. So why would you, why would you want to suffer you? No. When you find yourself quote and unquote, in a place where it seems you have not come into those things. Not that they are preparing you. There are two stages in life. In fact, there are three stages. The seed, the, the, excuse me, the stage of a seed, then the seed of the maturation of the seed, which I will call a developmental stage. And of course, then there's, there's a third stage, which is manifestation, harvest. So there's a, there's a first stage, which is your seed. Oftentimes, we may be in that place, and you know when you sow a seed, you don't see the manifestation. Does it mean that the seed is not there? Just because, amen, you can't see it. How many times has, have people walk over your land, or walk over your head, just because you are still a seed? No, people don't. People don't recognize a seed, and that is why we try to protect, amen, where we plant our seed, isn't it? Or else people will just walk over it. People are ignorant. They don't know that that is a farm. That 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 is a place we've planted a yam. We've planted a you know a, 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 a coconut, you know coconut or whatever it is. We planted something there. There is a seed planted. We don't know. We walk, and that's why we need to guard. We need to be aware of our seed and build an embankment, build a wall, build something to protect the seed. Or else people are going to walk over you. You're still a seed, but they don't care. You know, people look at me, sometimes I'm just a seed, all right? And they just walk over you. It's like you never exist. You don't exist. They don't care. <laughs> In that stage of being a seed, all kinds of things can be happening to you. In fact, you yourself might just give up on yourself because <laughs> for how long am I going to be on this ground? Nothing is going on. No, a process is taking place. All right? So that is just a word of encouragement to somebody. All right? So... Prayer is the place of awakening and the restoration of our spiritual sight to the degree that the revelation of God's wisdom start to flow into our mind. I didn't say into our spirit, into our mind and the faculties, amen, in a, in, into our minds and its faculty in a way that gives us the advantage to correctly position ourselves, to see the tools. Ugh, Isaiah, this is a mouthful of words. Let's break it down. <laughs> Let's break it down. All right. Prayer is the place of awakening, number one. And this awakening, amen, basically brings us to the place of the restoration. When you are spiritually awakened, remember the scripture we always quote on this platform, uh, 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 Isaiah 50 verse 4. Morning by morning, it awakens me. So every time you start to pray, something begins to happen your spirit begins to get awakened. Every time you pray, you are awakening your spirit. All right? Because your spirit can go into a state of uh, just quiet because you're not engaging God. You're not engaging God. So when you start to pray, it's like you go into activity. When you start to pray, it's like you're knocking the door. When you start to pray, it's like you're asking you know, for something. You're asking for direction. When you start to pray, you are you are interacting with God. Like I said, when you're praying, amen, you're having a conversation. And every time you have a conversation with God, hey, your spirit comes alive. Your spirit is awakening. Alright? That's a restoration. You're awakened. And, but this awakening that just doesn't just stop in your wow, now I see things. No. This awakening then begin to influence, begin to penetrate the realms of your mind, the realms of your faculty. That's why one of the one of the beauty of prayer, amen, is that it renews your mind. Prayer can renew your mind. Your mind can be renewed in the place of prayer. One of the quickest antidotes, amen, to sin is a prayer life. One of the quickest antidotes to sin is a prayer life. The less prayer life you have, 
the more tendency to fall into sin. The more tendency, amen, to fall into, into sin, amen, will prevail in your life. You know what? Because sin is our almost like our second nature. Sin is, is, is the nature of the soul life. And you know one thing that your soul is in the process of salvation. Right? Your spirit is saved, but your soul is being saved. Your soul is being saved. Alright? Your soul is not saved yet. It's in, that's why we yield daily. We submit daily. We get to renew our life. Until one day Paul said, it's no longer high. We lived. But Christ will live in me. But, you know, I, I, history, actually, theology tells us that that took Paul about 20, 20, 21, you know, uh, 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 um, years. Some even say 22 years. All right? From who will deliver me from this body of sin until he continued to walk upon his life. And then towards the end of his ministry, he says, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I died in the life of Paul. It was that same I that brought Lucifer down. So to conquer I, amen, is to continue to engage the mind, the faculty of our soul. You understand this? That's why you can be a Christian and still, amen, be oppressed by demons. Because demons, amen, perch on the rebellious areas of our mind, of our thought life, of our soul life. Yes. You can have the Holy Spirit which interacts with your spirit and you can have another spirit, amen, functioning in your life as a familiar spirit, as a wrong spirit. Why? Because you've opened that area of your life, amen, yes, to the path of darkness. That's why you see Christians, amen, act in certain ways and you'll ask yourself, are you actually a Christian? Hey, that person must have confessed Jesus Christ as his or Lord, but that person is not walking, is not allowing the spirit to grow and develop to the point that the spirit can take dominion over the activities of the soul. You can be born again, but your soul that is still empowered, you, you, you can be born again, but your spirit, your soul, amen, that is still a bully is the one defining the order of the day. You see why we talk about spiritual education? You have to train your spirit. Remember the book that I wrote some time ago. Let me see if I can find that uh, book. Uh, let me just see if I, if I have it here. All right, yes, I do have it here. Let me show you quickly. Oh, come on, how can I do this? No, I don't know how to do this again. Uh, do I hide this first? All right. Remember this book. Principle of Spiritual Fitness. Yes. This book teaches you how, amen, to spiritually develop your inner man, your spirit man. All right. Go look for the book. Read it. Okay. It's going to change your life. You will understand some of the things I'm trying to explain. Yes. Principle of Spiritual Fitness. How to train the spirit man to, to be strong in kingdom exploit. This is one of the best books I've ever written. But this next one that I'm bringing out, I don't, well, let me not compare. All right? So this book is very, very, very powerful. All right? You can see. We, we had to deal with dealt with it here as, you know, as a PowerPoint, you know. So I'm just trying to show you something here. All right, so what am I supposed to do? Okay, let's remove this. I'm back here, and then we're back to point number three. All right, it seems as if we need to begin to round up again at point number three because we're going all the way, all right, to point eight. So we might just try to round up here because of time. But has somebody really got in something this morning? All right, praise a place. All right, where we get to be spiritually awakened. God awakens us. All right? Just like you wake up in the morning. When you wake up in the morning, you become aware, isn't it? When you go to bed, all right, you sleep. You're not aware of what's going on around you. All right? Yes. Depending on the, even the kind of person you are. Some people, when they sleep, like me, I, I can still be a bit aware of what's going on around me. But we know when you're very tired, when you sleep, you sleep like a log. You don't bother, you know. So you basically are not aware. You can't be sleeping and be aware of what's going on on your computer. 
You can't be, a, be sleeping and be wondering or be, be thinking, oh, somebody is sending a message to your Facebook and you want to reply to the person. No, you can't be doing that. You cannot be doing that in the spirit because you are sleeping. But when you are aware, amen, you, you are alert. You can interact. You can relate with things around you. That's the point that I'm making. When you are awakening in the spirit, that is the same result you get. When you are awakening in the spirit, you are conversant of your spiritual environment. That's my point. You can see things in, in their true light. Your eyes has been opened. Your spiritual eyes has been opened. And when your spiritual eyes open, you can see things in their true nature. You see people in their true nature. You can see God. Amen. The pure in heart will see God. That's scripture. Matthew 5. The pure in heart. Are we, are we getting this clear, friends? So, spiritual awakening is very powerful. And that is why... The devil likes to counterfeit, you know, you know, a valid spiritual principle. If you know that, if you know a word today that has been perverted among spirit, you know, you know, spiritists and those who are into spiritism is awakening, spiritual awakening. If there is one word <clears throat> that the past of darkness, that those who, people who are into, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, yoga. Eastern religion, if there is one word they use the most, amen, is spiritual awakening. If you doubt me, you just go on Google or even on your Facebook, just tag, just type spiritual awakening and see what will come out. There was a time I did amen, a search on that word, spiritual awakening, as a, as a tag, you know, as an hashtag. I think I'm the only one, when I did on Facebook, I think I'm the only one that was saying something relating to spiritual awakening. The rest is evil, perversion. People are into all kinds of card reading, palm reading. All, I'm like, God help me here. It is, it, I mean, it is demonic. You type it when I'm done with this message. You just go type spiritual awakening. See what will come out. And yet the Bible tells us, Morning by morning, God awakens us. When I'm awakened, I shall be like him. That's David speaking. But you see, the devil is very good. He will hijack something that is very relevant, a word that will accelerate people. He will hijack it and pervert it. So, they are talking about an awakening that is false, that is demonic, that is satanic. Awakening that, you know, the devil is awakening people to strange foreign spirit, alien spirit. Yet God wants you and I because we are all spiritually, you know, asleep. If we're not asleep, we should know what is going on. We should know the next prophetic agenda of God. We should know what is happening next. We should be able to tell, hey, this is what is coming next because we are awakened. So as we sleep with different degrees, we also wake up in different degrees at different degrees. Some people are partially awake, you know. You can be partially awake, uh, yeah, you're still awake, but you are still not in a fully informed about what is happening around you. But, uh, okay, what are you saying? What did you say again? The guy is still trying to wake up. What are you saying again? Something important has been spoken, but because that person is still waking up. But when that person is full, what, what, what do you mean? Why did you say that? But I, I told you earlier before. You actually agree. I did I agree? No, I didn't agree. There's an argument because when that thing was said, that person was still partially awake. Still almost like between sleep and waking up. You know, you don't want to discuss something important to somebody that is just partially awake. <laughs> You're gonna create talk. I mean, you want somebody to sign something. Uh, boss, please can you put it inside it? But the boss is still waking up. No. The boss must still take his coffee. He must still, you know, do all the things he does. Then yes, he's ready. So what are you saying again? Aha, uh -huh, uh -huh, I'm, I'm fully awake. <laughs> you get a point. So certain things God is not going to tell us because we are still between, you know. <laughs> Amen. I'm done for today. I hope, I mean, the things that we've shared has brought light, clarity, understanding to the mind of God, the heart of God. Are you still sleeping or are you, are you awake? 
Prayer is the place of awakening and the place of restoration of our spiritual sight. You see things the way they are. To the degree that that sight, amen, now begins to give us the revelation of the wisdom of God. We know what to do about life, about things. We know how to address issues. We know, amen, how to engage circumstances. We are not at the mercy of, 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 of things. Amen. And of course, we looked at the first one. Let me quickly run through this again. Prayer is where our orphan spirit, amen, is dealt with. We are reconnected back to our Heavenly Father. We get to know God as our Heavenly Father. And that's a game changer. When you know God as your Father, that is a game changer. It changes your scope. It changes your perspective. It changes your sense of engagement. It changes your ability, your strength, amen. It changes who you are when you know you have a Father. And you know your father is there. And you know, amen, his intentions for your, for your life. For the plans that I have for you, said the father. Plans of good, not evil. So you're not running around thinking somebody is ready to chop off your head. You know, amen, that you've got confidence. If you read about great men and women of faith who have, you know, gone to be with the Lord. When you look at their, you know, their testimony, they so know God in the area of faith that they are so confident that when the enemy comes, they're like, you, please go. I don't have time for you. You understand this? We must have a clear, amen, understanding of our Father. And when we have the revelation of Father, that then speaks into the degree and the quality of faith, the degree and the quality of grace. That speaks into, amen, how we are able to walk in wisdom. Because all of this flows from his heart. You see, all those things we are seeking and running after, they flow from the fountain of the heart of the Father. When you pray, say, Father. Amen. I think we're done this morning. Thank you so very much, everyone that has joined me this morning. I hope once again, this word has been such a blessing to you. I hope this word has brought clarity, direction, insight. I hope this word has been a resource to you. May the word continue to empower you and may the Lord continue to bless you. We'll see you again, hopefully, maybe later today, later uh, uh, this afternoon, because I really want to come back, all right, and do uh, uh, the part two of this, uh, uh, you know, concept, you know, the rise of apostolic governmental intercession, intercessors. I know that I'm not done yesterday, so I want to finish that today. And uh, yeah, that is what we want to do. So thank you so very much, everyone that has joined us this morning. Uh, we are dealing with, amen. Reason for biblical focus prayer. The reason. So we're giving you a reason, and we believe this reason will remain a relevant one in our life. God bless you, friends. We'll see you again. Bye bye. Bye.